This call is now being recorded. Hello everyone. Uh, good morning to all. I am Jidin Chandra Babu Thumbeklam, Assistant Professor of Civil Engineering, uh, Francis Xavier Engineering College, Thirinalveli. On behalf of Francis Xavier Engineering College, I would like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to everyone of you who is th listening this event. I am so glad in introducing our honorable speaker, Dr. Arun Prasad, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography, School of Earth Science, Central University of Tamil Nadu. He is completed his PhD on spectral analysis for the species characterization of mangroves of Bidarkaniga National Park, Odisha, using hyperspectral remote sensing from Indian Institute of Spain's Space Science and Technology, Tuandrum. He has completed MSc in Earth Remote Sensing and Geoinformation Technology from Madurai Kamaraj University and obtained BSc in Geography from Government College, Karivatam Campus, University of Kerala, Tuandra. He has gained much academic experiences in various grades like Project Fellow, Postdoctoral Researcher, Gus Faculty, and currently being Assistant Professor. He is at attended more than 25 national and international conferences and workshops and has published around 10 international journals. He is a life member in various technical bodies and has also received many awards and honors. With this introduction, I welcome Dr. Arun Prasad sir for this session on hyperspectral remote sensing and application. I hand over this session to him. Over to you sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for uh, for your brief introduction and uh, good morning to all. Um, so myself, uh, Harun Prasad, I'm working as a professor from in uh, Department of Geography, uh, Centers of Tamil Nadu. I'm glad to meet you all in online. So, uh, so shall we proceed to the presentation? Just sharing the screen. So uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, AACT and uh, Francis Civil Engineering College Department of Civil Engineering for providing this opportunity uh, to deliver a lecture on this uh, topic, hyperspectral remote sensing and its applications. And I would like to uh, thank uh, the head of the department, Department of Civil Engineering, for uh, uh, giving me this chance. Uh, and uh, thank you. So with this, I will just uh, start my presentation. So the presentation topic, as you know, <clears throat> is. Uh, Hyperspectral remote sensing and its uh, applications. So, um, so uh, I know, like uh, last few days, you have been hearing this remote sensing uh, a lot. Uh, but uh, just to, I just want to refresh uh, these concepts once again, so that it be easy for you to, for me to drag you to the uh, remote sensing hyperspectral part. So, I just start with the uh, uh, brief introduction on remote sensing. So remote sensing, we know uh, it's the uh, art. Uh, it's a uh, science uh, which uh, actually observes the object or phenomenon uh, which is uh, which is not in contact with the uh, uh, sensor. Uh, so as we know, our eye is also a remote sensor because we see, but we don't have any contact with that object. What we see, but we recognize the object. So that is how the sensors also record the. Um, ob object or phenomenon or landscape uh, dynamics, whatever it is, in the perspective of earth remote sensing. So uh, it records this, um, uh, uh, records the uh, feature in multiple uh, wavelengths so that you can process and you can learn, uh, you can uh, infer the data for further processing. So it's a part of. Um, like uh, remote sensing is not a, a separate sense; it is a interdisciplinary subject rather. Uh, so it is a part, it has this part of physical sciences, it has its part of uh, biological sciences, uh, social sciences, and uh, remote sensing is part of geoinformatics, which also includes uh, cartography, uh, ge geographic information system, geodesy, and surveying. Uh, so uh, we call it as uh, geoinformatics as a common name. Which is of which uh, remote sensing is one of the major part of geoinformatics. So before that, uh, <clears throat> we would like to know uh, what is EMR. EMR is uh, electromagnetic radiation. So it is actually uh, uh, propagated. It is propagated from the uh, sun's external, like outer atmosphere, and it travels through vacuum uh, to the Earth's atmosphere. 
so at the speed of light so the speed of light we know 300 to the power of 8 uh, meter per second and uh, it has like it uh, the wavelength is propagating at multiple wavelengths so depending on the wavelength uh, the frequency also varies because they have uh, inverse relationship with each other so uh, in in remote sensing uh, we usually recognize the region in electromagnetic spectrum using its wavelength so wavelength is nothing but the distance between successive peaks so we have successive peaks and uh, the distance between these two uh, successive peaks are called uh, uh, is called a wavelength and uh, frequency is in how many number of cycles it passes at a particular instance per second so that is the uh, uh, called the frequency so from this we know that if the frequency is uh, a frequency if the wavelength is short the frequency would be uh, more if the wavelength is long the frequency would be less so so this is the inverse relationship existing between uh, uh, frequency and uh, wavelength so c is uh, nothing but the velocity of light c is equal to mu lambda like mu it's the multiple it's the product of uh, uh, the frequency and the wavelength so this is what we have discussed so it's uh, if it is the the wavelength is relatively uh, longer wavelength then the frequency is shorter a lot lower and uh, if the uh, wavelength is relatively shorter then the frequency would be higher so because more number of uh, waves could pass the particular uh, point at a particular uh, time so that's why the frequency is higher for the shorter wavelengths so so we understand that there is a inverse relationship between uh, wavelength and frequency so niels bohr and max planck has recognized the uh, discrete nature of uh, these uh, energy radians uh, which is uh, uh, propagating from the uh, through the electromagnetic radiation and they proposed the quantum theory based on that so uh, they proposed that uh, the energy is transferred as a uh, a uh, discrete packets of energy called quanta or photons rather than the wave form so based on that they propose the relationship between the energy of the photon and the associated uh, frequency or wavelength so this is what they have proposed q is equal to h uh, mu uh, q is the energy of the quanta and h is the planck constant which is 6.626 6.626 into 10 to the power of minus 34 joule per sec joule second and uh, mu is the frequency of the radiation so Uh, we and we know that there is a inverse relationship between uh, uh, frequency and wavelength so we can rewrite this uh, uh, formula as q equal to q is equal to hc by lambda so uh, planck's constant into speed of uh, light both are constants divided by lambda so we understand that there is a inverse relationship between energy and wavelength so if the wavelength is increasing then the energy of that wave would be decreased uh, would be less if the wavelength is shorter or it's a, a short uh, small wavelength uh, energy small wavelength uh, emr region then the energy of that region would be much higher so this is the inverse relationship so that is what uh, uh, established here through this quantum theory energy of a quantum increases means wavelength of that quantum would be less or vice versa so uh, photoelectric effect is one of the um, uh, this is the the uh, the spot responsible phenomenon which leads to the propagation of this uh, uh, emr from the um, uh, sun's uh, outer atmosphere so the matter in the uh, sun's plasma is much heated to the such a high temperature so uh, that actually leads to the break up of the electron and it move uh, and it no it if it is if it it actually uh, free flow it it actually emit as an uh, as a energy with a, a particular amount of uh, in a, a particular amount of in a particular wavelength so that is called a uh, photoelectric effect and the electron which got free uh, due to this uh, photoelectric effect is called a photo electron and uh, once the electron is uh, lost then that atom would is, is called as ion like it's because it is negatively charged because it has lost an it has uh, lost one uh, um, negatively charged electron from its valence uh, 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 from its in its valence uh, so uh, this this way the continuous uh, uh, losing of the loose uh, continuous absorption of this uh, photon and it consequently the emission of electron happens in the 
uh, sends plasma. That's why it leads to the continuous spectrum. So that's why we get the um, uh, spectra continuously, uh, EMR. Uh, so the photoelectric effect is responsible for the for uh, for us to receive the uh, continuous uh, EMR from the sun. So uh, so the, it, the so we have to consider the black body. Uh, 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 loss uh, for understanding the energy and the wavelength uh, associated with that energy. So one such law is the uh, Wien's displacement law. So here we know that uh, uh, this is the uh, radiance curve, uh, spectral radiance exudance of uh, the different materials at different temperature. So uh, this is a different wavelength. So this is uh, uh, 200K. Suppose if a black body is in the, uh, in a temperature, uh, 200 Kelvin, then the ex spectral radiance would be ranging in this particular uh, region. So roughly from uh, 7.5 to uh, some 40 uh, my, uh, micrometer, uh, 40 uh, micrometer, and uh, and this if it is heated up, it would it would uh, shift towards the uh, shorter wavelength. So this is 300 K is the Earth's um, temperature, Earth's surface uh, average temperature. So uh, we understand that uh, the uh, the Earth's uh, radiance is means in emittance, not uh, reflectance. Emittance would be ranging from somewhat four micrometer to uh, nearly 50, uh, 50 micrometer. So uh, if it is heated up, if the same black body is heated up uh, to a extreme temperature, say for example, if it reaches the temperature of the sun's temperature, sun's atmosphere, uh, sun's outer surface plasma temperature which is uh, 6,000 Kelvin. Then in it, the 6,000 Kelvin, if it is reached to uh, 6,000 Kelvin, then it would, uh, the the maximum spectral radiance would be in the visible region of the uh, spectra. So visible region of the spectra is in 0.4 to 0.7 micrometer. So we know that this is the, this is the, this area, this area is the maximum spectral radiance. So it, because it reaches the peak over here, so, uh, the my so we are from this we understand that uh, the sun's as it is in the temperature of 6000 kelvin it emit it uh, uh, emits radiation at the maximum uh, it it uh, of course it emits radiation at uh, throughout the wavelength starting from uh, gamma rays to the uh, radio waves uh, but uh, the maximum radiation of sun would be in the visible spectrum visible light so this is what uh, the beans displacement law try to establish and uh, so this is the relationship is lambda max is equal to a by t so where a is wind's constant and t is the temperature absolute temperature of the black body so when we consider sun as the black body uh, when uh, when the temperature is much higher then that uh, lambda max which means the wavelength at which the maximum spectral radiance occurs would be in the shorter wavelength if they say if we compare the same with the uh, earth's perspective then it, because the Earth's uh, spectral is X temperature is uh, 300 Kelvin average temperature, so it emits uh, radiation at the longer wavelength because of its less temperature. So this is what. So we you know, understand that if the temperature increases, this is the peak maximum spectral emittance peak. It actually shifting towards the shorter wavelength. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so that is this is what we have explained in the last figure. So this is uh, 79 Kelvin liquid air, uh, so 195 Kelvin uh, dry ice. So different uh, materials at a different temperature as given here. So I so here we understand that this is 6000 Kelvin sun. So the maximum spectral radiance is occurring between 0.4 to 0.7 micrometer. <coughs> So, which is falling in the visible light. So, when coming to this uh, Earth's, uh, Earth's uh, example, so this is the uh, sun's peak and this one is the Earth's peak. So, Earth's peak is actually in the temperature between 4 micrometer to nearly 25 uh, micrometer and the Earth's uh, maximum wavelength radiance is occurring at the wavelength of 9.66 micrometer. So, uh, Earth's emittance would be higher in the, um, higher at this particular wavelength. So this is emissive spectra rather than the refractive spectra. So we understand that uh, this is the incoming. So uh, since the sun is at the extreme temperature, it emits the uh, wavelength. It emits the radiation maximum at the shorter wavelength. 
so it is transmission it is transmitted to the earth surface and earth surface is getting heated up and it the emission of uh, the it, of course it is not heated up to that temperature of uh, sun so the emission is higher at uh, emission of this uh, heated earth would be in the longer wavelength so uh, this is what uh, the thermal remote sensing perspective uh, uh, in the thermal remote sensing people try to uh, measure so <coughs> uh emr when it travels from the sun's uh, uh, outer surface uh, towards the earth it actually undergoes multiple uh, uh, interaction so if uh, some uh, uh, for example ha some 100 uh, ray 100 uh, uh, waves are uh, coming from the photons or are, are uh, emitted from the sun it actually uh, travels through the vacuum at the initial point of time so it travels at the speed of uh, uh, light and it reaches up, it it actually reaches up to the point uh, where uh, the upper where upper uh, until the point of outer atmosphere of the earth so uh, when it reaches the outer atmosphere it uh, actually enters into the medium which is somewhat denser than the vacuum because uh, we have in our atmosphere outer atmosphere we have uh, gas different types of gases so it actually has compo it actually makes the atmosphere a little denser than the vacuum so when it when the also the when the waves act, uh, rays try to come to the earth's surface it actually has to undergo multiple uh, interactions with the atmosphere because the atmospheric composition is also different at different heights so uh, first the scattering happens in the atmosphere so in atmosphere if the scattering happens some energy loss uh, would be happen at the uh, when it reaches the its upper outer atmosphere then uh, the clouds on the uh, its atmosphere would be reflecting some part of the energy back and uh, the trans uh, some trans uh, it will be transmitted of energy which surface so the second interaction happens at the terrain on the surface this thing happens so uh, earth's objects absorbs emits and uh, transmits the same radiation at different uh, levels based on its chemical and physical properties so the second interaction also happens at the uh, or the uh, also uh, makes the energy uh, to lose some part of it then again this reflected energy or radiated energy is actually has to go through the atmosphere again so the same interaction would happen uh, the scattering absorption transfer would happen again at the atmosphere and it is the sensor system so the sensor system also has the optical uh, attachment so the interaction would also happen at the sensor system so what we have to understand is Uh, when uh, uh, some hundred rays are uh, emitted from the sun, after all these interactions, only some twenty to five ray waves uh, would be reaching the sensor. So we have to uh, consider all these factors while we process the remote sensing image for our uh, interpretation purpose. Okay. So, uh, so these are some of the interaction happens in the atmosphere. So first happens the atmospheric refraction. so uh, when uh, a light passes from a less dense medium to the optically more dense medium uh, the path of it will be reflected so here the incident radius have uh, having the angle of uh, have theta 1 uh, when it and the index of refraction of this layer of atmosphere is n1 we had we can consider that then the if if the these two uh, layers are having the same uh, optical density means it would have gone like this but the optically this layer is more denser denser than this uh, upper uh, part so it has deflected uh, towards this direction so the new angle uh, with the normal is uh, theta 2 so again it actually enters into the less dense medium so it again def got deflected the new angle would be theta 3 so uh, it uh, Uh, so we have to understand that uh, the rays would deflect uh, to uh, towards or away from the normal based on the optical density of the atmosphere at different layers so we can calculate using the uh, index of uh, refraction 
uh, for different materials. So index of refraction for <coughs> for a particular material can be calculated by C by Cn, where C is the velocity of light at vacuum, and Cn is the velocity of light at the uh, or of, at this through this material. So uh, we can uh, derive this using this uh, relationship, and uh, we can uh, determine the angle at what angle the, the energy would be reflected using this formula n1 sin theta 1 by n2 okay so this is first first interaction which is refraction because it touches from the vacuum to the upper atmosphere so the second one will be uh, scattering so uh, scattering is responsible for the blue sky so the the gas molecules in the atmosphere actually absorb uh, actually scatters away the shorter wavelength uh, the blue radiation in the emr and it actually uh, so the scattered blue radiation is creating the blue sky so uh, it is also responsible uh, for the evening uh, skies like uh, the orange color or the red color red skies because that one is actually the uh, because the at, at the evening time uh, or in the early morning time the sun uh, the sun would be much at, at the longer distance so it is not near normal uh, near nadir so the sun's rays has to travel a lot so at the point where it reaches the sky, uh, the shorter wavelength uh, would have already been scattered away. So the only thing left is uh, the longer wavelength. So the gas the, in the lower atmosphere, uh, the smoke and dust or the much larger gas particles would be scattering the uh, longer wavelength. So that's why we get the uh, red or orange skies in the evening. So scattering can be classified into three types based on which material is actually scattering the EMR. First one is gas molecules, so is responsible for the rally scattering. Smoke and dust is responsible for the may scattering, and water vapor is uh, responsible for the non-selective scattering. Uh, so the atmosphere in we have different uh, layers of the atmosphere, and at different layers we have different composition. So in troposphere, which is nearer to the Earth surface, we have uh, dominant uh, uh, water vapor or molecules, and aerosols would be a dominant one. And when you go to the next level, which is stratosphere or mesosphere, when we go there, we have we have more uh, carbon dioxide, trace gases, other gas molecules like nitrogen would be much <coughs> more. And at the uh, over the stratosphere, we have ozone layer, we have O3, so which also deflects, which actually absorbs the uh, UV radiation and scatters away few shorter wavelengths based on the wavelength. So uh, we have different layer atmospheres. Atmospheric layers uh, actually scattering away different uh, uh, wavelengths. So the, we have we have a refraction, we have scattering, and the next one is absorption, which is more important in this perspective of remote sensing, uh, because absorption is actually happened due to different processes, which we will see in the la later slides. So um, different gases behave differently in the atmosphere. So based on its uh, chemical bond and uh, based on its uh, structure. It actually uh, absorbs a certain, but only particular wavelengths of a particular uh, of this EMR. So here we understand, we know that. Um, so this is actually these uh, curves actually represents the atmospheric absorption at different wavelength by different gases. So this actually represents the H2O uh, absorption of H2O water vapor. This actually represents uh, uh, carbon dioxide, and this uh, this one uh, this curve actually represents the absorption by ozone and oxygen and this one by nitrogen nitrogen oxide so <clears throat> so since these all these uh, gases are on the atmosphere uh, so we have to take the cumulative uh, uh, effect of this particular of these of all these gases to understand the absorb the atmosphere in general so this black actually represents the absorption peaks uh, by different gases at different ways. And this area is used for remote sensing because uh, we have uh, the source at, uh, from the uh, sun which is also away from the, which is out, outside of the atmosphere and the sensor system what we use in the space, uh, bond remote sensing, side remote sensing, uh, we have the sensor at, uh, outside the atmosphere. So, uh, the atmospheric action, atmospheric effect on this EMR is inevitable. So 
it actually happens twice once it once when it enters the uh, earth surface and the second time when it leaves the um, uh, leaves that muscle so, uh, these region one is specific regions of the emr is free uh, absorption it's like a, uh, a like when we construct a house uh, we uh, we have all these uh, uh, we have we have constructed the walls and we keep a window for air flow right so it is similar to that. only the air can go through the window uh, we have as we have all closed the uh, closed the uh, we have all closed walls and we have kept only one window so that window is kept for air flow similarly uh, this gas behaves so, well, so it absorbs all the uh, radiation uh, only few part of it is left uh, only few region is getting uh, free to enter because of the uh, because these wavelengths at we these wavelengths these gases would not absorb more so, such uh, regions are called atmospheric window so this way it's called atmospheric window so atmospheric window is nothing but uh, the wavelength which is not absorbed by the gases or constraints which is free to enter the earth surface through the atmosphere is called atmospheric window okay so if uh, if we have any gas in the atmosphere our radiation the incoming radiation should be like this uh, like a dark brown uh, curve uh, fortunately or unfortunately we have uh, atmosphere uh, fortunately then we have uh, we should have atmosphere right so uh, uh, this uh, we had atmosphere so these regions are absorbed so these are some region we got absorbed by different uh, cumulative action of different gases so only this part this, this light uh, uh, pale color this is the curve which we get uh, the actual uh, spectral irradiance from the um, sun at the sea level okay so that we have seen the effect of atmosphere on the emr uh, radiation that's interaction so the next one would be the terrain so terrain uh, we have different features and different objects and all these objects are not uh, the same so we have they have different chemical composition they have different uh, uh, physical and textural composition so it all depends on uh, like it all uh, uh, it all responsible for the um, energy interaction uh, of, with the emr so uh, we can, basically we can broadly classify the materials uh, into four uh, basic types first one is uh, a perfect spectral factor. It is like a glassy water, or a, or a, it's like we consider it as a glass surface. So you you can put a, a glass on the uh, ground, um, clear uh, no, like a reflecting glass on the ground, and you can uh, mirror. And uh, if you keep a light at a particular angle, instant angle, uh, you keep, so you get reflected, and it is reflected at, a, at the same angle. So the angle of incidence. Would be this, and the angle of existence would be the same. So that is what they try to uh, uh, I try to say. So if the surface is like a glassy water, or it uh, actually is a, it's like a mirror. So the angle of incidence and the angle of existence with the normal is the same. So uh, for example, glassy water is an uh, example. And uh, next one is near perfect uh, specular reflector, where it is um it is like the same like a rippled water or uh, uh, some uh, small uh, attenuates would be there the water surface or the surface is very clear means the maximum radiance would be in the same angle but we can also observe few radiance at other angles also so this is that's why it is called near perfect it's not a perfect it's a near perfect uh, most of the surface on the earth surface is like a uh, uh, diffuse reflector because they have protection properties and the uh, earth surface is not not homogeneous uh, it's uh, mostly heterogeneous and uh, so uh, it reflects at all angles at different intensity so sometimes it may reflect in, in this in this angle the intensity is more uh, whereas uh, at different angles the uh, the different at different intensity the uh, radius is being reflected that's why it is called near perfect diffuse reflector. Uh, if it is perfect, it should it would uh, reflect at all angles at equal Hello. intensity. Sir? Hello, sir. Your uh, presenting screen is not visible. 
your slide is is not visible no 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 it is visible visible it's visible and it is continue sir continue sir. visible visible yeah yeah thank you but okay so uh so the in uh, the fourth type is a perfect diffuse reflector or lambertian surface the lambertian surface is like uh, it reflects at all angles at equal intensity so it's a, a lambertian surface for calibration purpose in remote and in hot water remote sensing particularly uh, have some calibrated surface or lambertian surface uh, to calibrate the sensor so that you will see in the later part uh, yeah so these are the four basic reflectors uh when we consider it as uh, when we consider the emr uh, interaction with the terrain so uh, we have different uh, wavelengths uh, in emr and uh, so this is the different um, uh, wavelengths so based starting from the uh, sh shorter wavelength we have gamma rays and uh, then comes the x ray then ultraviolet ray and uh, we have visible region here so in visible region we uh, we have three major regions uh, blue green and red so blue is from 400 to 500 uh, green from 500 to 600 and uh, uh, red is from 600 to 700 nanometer and uh, we have after that we have uh, refractive infrared so it is it can be further classified into near infrared short range infrared and uh, then we have a thermal infrared so thermal infrared is nothing but the Visible infrared. That is what we have discussed in the earlier part. Uh, so, at what wavelength? Will be because of the temperature of the Earth's surface, it emits radiation at a longer wavelength. So, that is that is what uh, we have. It is mentioned as a thermal infrared. Then we have microwave, or uh, it is usually the radar motions, and we have the radio, wave, which is basically for the uh, communication purpose. So, uh, so we have to recall the quantum theory. So, we have a. a Uh, see that Q is equal to H C by lambda, so energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So in remote sensing, we usually uses the region from visible to thermal infrared and microwave region. So only this region is used in the remote sensing. Uh, this is because uh, from the quantum theory, we understand that if the wavelength is uh, uh, shorter, the energy will be higher. So the gamma rays, X rays. And ultraviolet rays, the shorter wavelength energy, short shorter wavelength EMR. So obviously, it, they have the higher energy. Moreover, uh, these uh, regions are absorbed by the uh, atmosphere. So we don't have it in a passive remote sensing. So passive remote sensing in the sense, uh, the source of energy EMR is sun. Uh, we cannot use it in the uh, active remote sensing also because these region, these wavelengths are having higher energy. It would cause some. Uh, it would interact with the cells of the uh, uh, living organisms if we if we choose, or it would degrade the properties of the uh, materials. So that's why we don't usually use the we, we don't usually use this these regions uh, unless unless uh, until it is specifically needed. So uh, in earth remote sensing, uh, in uh, mic if we use in longer wavelength we use until the part microwave. and the radio waves we don't uh, usually use because of its longer wavelength as well as it is basically used for communication purpose so it, it should not clash with the um, communication systems what we use as well as the radio waves is having longer wavelength so as per quantum theory we have less energy so this to absorb this less energy the sensor has to be has to be kept in uh, kept in uh, uh, stagnant for a longer time which is not possible with the uh space born remote sensing or air born remote sensing uh so uh, moreover the energy uh, obtained from the radio in a uh, wavelength is actually much lesser to be generated as an image so that's why we usually don't use the radio uh, waves also for the uh, earth, uh, earth remote sensing earth observation technology okay so these are different regions we use in uh, uh, general earth remote sensing for target detection so blue region actually starting from 400 to 500 nanometer so uh, it is usually uh, used for uh, bathymetry uh, surface mapping or uh, to identify uh, water uh, composition or uh, uh, it actually uses mostly used in the uh, blue refracting surfaces and green is basically used for identifying the vegetation and red is also uh, used in uh, vegetation and uh, bathymetry purpose 
uh, and uh, mapping of bathymetry and the near infrared is also used mostly used in vegetation and uh, man made object viewing and uh, shorter wavelength is uh, short wave infrared and mid wave infrared they all have their uh, particular applications uh, for uh, different purposes we use uh, we use different wavelengths so longer wavelength is long long, long wave infrared is basically the uh, thermal remote sensing uh, so emissive radiance so here they use uh, for uh, basically for thermal analysis and identification and detection of uh, different mineral minerals based on its absorption at this wavelength and soil types and uh, canopy cover uh, so camouflage mapping in military purposes so all these things they use the emissive infrared okay so we have seen this so based on these spectra what we use we can uh, basically have uh, these much uh, uh, based on what region we use we have uh, different types of remote sensing so optical so multi spectral and hyperspectral are called optical remote sensing because it uses the region from visible to reflective infrared so only these regions are used so visible uh, or far uv uh, you may consider so far uv visible and reflective infrared which means uh, near infrared and short wave infrared they use so uh, they they the optical remote sensing can be further classified into multi spectral and hyperspectral based on how many bands we use so that that is what the uh, the our percentage is meant for so we will see in the next slides and uh, next one is uh, thermal remote sensing thermal remote sensing uses uh, a thermal infrared region which is in this uh, msu uh, region 8 to 14 Uh, uh micrometer and uh, next uh, microwave which is radar remote sensing and uh, we have lidar lidar is like a, it uses laser pulses at uh, uh, for mapping the uh, uh, basically used for altitude uh, mapping so we have different resolutions in uh, remote sensing so first one is uh, spatial remote so, sorry spatial resolution uh spatial resolution is analogous to the map scale which is common in our uh, uh, maps uh, like topographic maps or general maps so how many centimeter in the map represents uh, like 1 cm on the map represents how many meters on the actual ground so that is the map scale it is analogous uh, so in remote sensing purpose perspective we call it as a spatial resolution where one pixel in a image how many like one pixel uh, represents how many Uh, square meters or square kilometer whatever it is on the ground actual ground so uh, if we choose we have to choose uh, uh, the data uh, according to the um, need like uh, if we are going for a uh, like a large scale uh, mapping we need every detail means we have to go for the much uh, higher resolution higher resolution in the sense short like the it should the one pixel should cover less Uh, less amount of uh, like it should cover less square meters or square uh, like square meter on the ground so if we go if we are going for some generalized mapping more general maps means we can choose 30 meter or 100 meter even resolution so it depends so in um, in 30 meter so this is an example so in uh, like we have a house here and this if the same this house is been mapped using a 30 meter by 30 meter uh, pixel means the output may look like this it appears that the house has occupied the whole pixel region but it has only occupied 3/4 of the region so one this region is not house but due to the resolution it appears like this whole pixel is covered with house but when we go for a fine resolution uh, like a uh, some 5 meter means so we can see that this region this region is being uh this is a free space and only this region is house further if we go further like a 1 meter resolution so we can clearly see that the house uh, the region occupied by the house is clearly been distinctive and the outer space is also clearly visible so we understand that if we go for uh if if you want to uh, distinct uh, if you want to uh, uh like uh, identify the object which is small enough in that uh, in the real surface mean we have to choose the remote sensing data which is also compatible to identify that particular small object okay so the next one is uh, spectral resolution spectral resolution is nothing but how many bands we have so how it at the we have uh, emr region at uh, 
in in optical remote sensing we have from far uv to short wave infrared so at how many bands or how many instances we sample the uh, data uh, sample at how many bands we use for the remote sensing uh, in uh, for observing the same region so uh in landsat we have uh, four uh, bands for green red nar and uh, near infrared which in mss multispectral scanner uh when you go for some much higher resolution means we have different number of bands which uh, actually the hyperspectral remote sensing is meant for so okay so spectral resolution is like uh, at what uh, wavelength the maximum intensity is being calculated for the particular uh, for, for that particular band so that is the central wavelength and spectral resolution is at what is the uh, full width half maximum full width half maximum in the sense if you uh, plot a curve like this for a particular band the signal uh, intensity would be like this so the maximum intensity would be at the half distance so this is the uh, observed uh, like a uh, useful uh, energy obtained would be at the half uh, at the half uh, like 50 percentage of the intensity uh, at this particular region i uh, they ca uh, they calculate the uh, uh, minimum and maximum wavelength and this is the bandwidth so this is actually called spectral resolution okay. then uh, so this is a uh, spatial resolution and this is a spectral resolution and uh, the next one is radiometric resolution radiometric resolution is is the gray level at, at how many uh, gray level we observe the data so also what is the use of having higher uh, bits like uh, we can have 8 bits data we can have 16 bit data we we do have so what is the use of having different bits means uh, in an image uh, if if uh, the, the the all the if you take a separate band if you take in remote sensing if you take individual bands all in, all the bands are in gray gray scale uh so it is it you, only if you combine the bands only you can see the color image rather if you choose only one band we see it as a um, gray image so the in that in that particular gray image the darkest pixel would be assigned the value zero and the brightest pixel would be assigned the value based on the bit we choose suppose if we choose uh, two eight bit data means the darkest pixel at that uh, image would be given zero and the brightest pixel would be given the value 255 so how we get the 255 2 to the power of n n means how many bits 2 to the power of 8 is 256 so it ranges from zero to 255 255 256 gray levels starting from zero to 255 so if we have 16 bit image Uh, then uh, the bits uh, would be much higher so what happens is the similarly reflecting surfaces uh, like we have different surfaces uh, in an urban environment which is similarly reflecting at a particular wavelength uh, if if we increase the bit level this uh, based on the intensity this would be as uh, taking different uh, dn values digital number values so uh, so going to a much higher uh, bit may increase the contrast between the similarly reflecting object so that is why we have we can choose we may choose the radiometric resolution higher for uh, a, a strongly heterogeneous surface okay and the next one is uh, uh, temporal resolution temporal resolution is nothing but revisit time so how often the data has been collected for a, uh, for a particular region so say for example uh, thermal valley uh, which is uh, like one sensor is actually imaging thermal valley uh on uh, this day like 26th of uh, september at 10:15 the image has been obtained for a particular region and next uh, cycle uh, when would when it would happen so why we need uh, like a, a, for a particular application like a disaster management we are going for a, some uh, disaster management or uh, some uh, continuous monitoring is required means we have to choose for higher temporal <coughs> resolution data because you need data different at every week or every 3 days you need data means you have to go for uh, tempo high temporal resolution data uh, for uh, like uh, plant growth monitoring or vegetation monitoring or uh, uh, some invasive species like that means you can go for some every 15 days data is required the data data is required you can do like that 
suppose if some data like a uh, geological mappings where uh, the minerals may not get degraded in the very short span of time so for that you can go for uh, less temporal resolution let's say for example one month every month or every two months you can have data and you can process the data so it depends on the need what is the application you are going to do and for based on that you can choose the temporal resolution so in in hyperspectral remote sensing in this uh, for this presentation we have to we are more concerned about this particular uh, resolution which is spectral resolution so uh, like spectral hyperspectral so uh, we have classified the optical remote sensing into multispectral and hyperspectral based on the spectral resolution so spectral resolution we have seen uh, like uh, um, in multispectral uh, the bands the bandwidth is larger so this is the bandwidth so for blue band the bandwidth is uh, larger green band of course it, uh, like ranging from 0.55 to uh, 0.6 so the bandwidth is larger so the curve is much broader uh, like uh, uh, like it is like a more um, uh, platycartic okay so in uh, so the spectral resolution is uh, uh, the bandwidth is higher would, would be higher so uh, what obviously happens obviously happens is the number of bands used for the image acquisition would be less in number say for 10 less than 10 uh, bands would be available for the uh, for the whole spectral region starting from uh, blue to visible to and infrared or short wave infrared so uh, the number of based on the uh, based on these bands we have to generate a curve so the when we generate when we uh, generate a curve for different materials so each pixel uh, has uh, has got some discreetly sampled spectrum so the first band is located here second band is located here third uh, band is located here fourth band is located fifth here sixth here seventh here and eighth here so for this material we understand that there is some peak over here in the uh, near infrared region or uh, yeah, near infrared region but we are we, we clearly don't see any uh, idea we, of course we understand we may understand that it may be a vegetation or something like that this is similarly we when this blue uh, like when this green curve we, we consider the maximum frequencies have somewhere here and then it is like, getting uh, absorbed over here and it is reaches it reaches here so uh, we understand we can roughly understand something uh, some uh, similar objects but the problem arises that uh, so when we have different uh, uh, materials like uh, uh, buildings uh, vegetation water uh, barren land so if the land use is much uh, having like different variety means then multispectral is enough to have a um, like a classification so level one uh, level two classification is fine with the uh, multispectral data but when we go for higher level classification level three classification where you go for when you take away here in this high level one or level two classification we which take vegetation as a, a single class vegetation but when you go for our agricultural land is agricultural land but when you go for higher level classification say for example in agriculture you want to distinguish the crops rice cultivation paddy cultivation you have to uh, separate as a paddy uh, you have to uh, label it as a paddy and uh, we have to label uh, label as a plantain we have to label as uh, maize crop or cash crops whatever it is then uh, in vegetation we have different species means uh, the same same like uh, some uh, species one species two species three like that you have to classify the uh, vegetation into different species means all these spectra would be looking the same when you take this example so vegeta like uh, this is vegetation in as a general spectra when you uh, take for different uh, vegetation uh, classes the spectra would be the same for at at uh, multispectral uh, point multispectral resolution but uh, to in order to classify the similarly reflecting objects different objects we need to go for much higher uh, like or uh, much finer resolution in spectral resolution perspective so um, multispectral is of course success, uh, successful i am not saying that hyperspectral is uh, much superior uh, or uh, uh, like that but uh, but my multispectral is having global application as of now so the data is available the data is available from the from 1970s all uh, itself so because the sensor technology has been recently developed for hyperspectral data so in order to know the change reduction or trend analysis uh, multispectral is the uh, obvious way 
to identify that and it has global coverage so much of the hyperspectral sensor what we use or what we have here is not having global coverage so far uh, so the not every point on the earth is been sampled by hyperspectral data by sensors so hypers multispectral is uh, having that uh, so uh, like uh, quality and uh, spatial temporal analysis if you want to have a uh, multi temporal data so every 3 days you need uh, data means uh, then multispectral is the obvious way of obtaining because of the uh, large amount of data they already exist so some of the most important or prominent uh, sensors uh, satellite systems available are plansat from usgs sentinel from esa like uh, european space agency irs series from isro uh, spot from cnes so these are some different uh, sensors available uh, for multispectral remote sensing in case of hyperspectral so why we consider hyper why we now are more concerned about the hyperspectral since the like uh, our technology has been evolved uh, so the sensors are now having much higher capability or like sophisticated sensors we have and uh, Uh, based like processing algorithms we have and we have uh, much higher robust uh, um, uh, processing softwares and we have uh, robust technologies in uh, storage and processing uh, uh, hardwares we have so uh, these advances actually have made uh, the hyperspectral uh, remote sensing a viable one even for a uh, end user so uh, hyperspectral remote sensing is having is, is has been a talk of this uh, the more sensing fraternity in uh, last 2 3 decades but now the hyperspectral has gained much more importance than before because of its more uh, like because of its availability and applicability uh, for everyone so so here we in, we understand that this is the broadband like broadband sensor uh, like the emr visible uh, near infrared is somewhere here and uh, short range infrared and long range infrared so in multispectral what how they usually sample is band 1 for blue band 2 for green band 3 for red band 4 for uh, near infrared band 5 for short range infrared 1 band 7 for uh, short range infrared 2 band 6 for thermal infrared so this is how the usually they sample the data so every region gets one band where in hyperspectral each of these region has been has been um, uh, distinct or divided into different number of bands so you get more number of bands uh, in even within a within this region so we have plethora of data we have lot of information available now so how we do how we are going to deal with the data and how useful the data is so that is the next question right so hyper itself hyper means in greek hyper means more or above or exaggerated so uh, this is one example this is called hypercube like uh, here the x x x uh, the x axis and y axis represents the latitude and longitude and the z axis the third axis actually represents the number of bands how many number of bands are there so here we have 224 bands ranging from 400 nanometer to 2500 nanometer so when we arrange uh, the different number of bands as a, as the in the third dimension we get a, we can generate a cube called a hypercube so in our earlier example we have seen different materials are at different uh, wavelengths so we have discrete uh, spectrum whereas in hyperspectral since all these regions are been sampled earlier we had only one sam one uh, band here second band over here so we have to connect it through a straight line whereas now we have many number of bands in between so we have we can connect those points and while we look into that connected points we get a continuous spectrum so we get a continuous spectrum means we have every detailed record right earlier our uh, in our earlier example we have seen like we have seen this so uh, the discrete sampling has actually avoided many very minor information very crucial information available between these regions or these regions but here we can see the small absorption uh, over here and uh, yeah over here and the reflectance uh, somewhere here and the small absorption peak uh, troughs over here and the uh, reflectance peaks over these regions are also been uh, clearly distinctive now so hyperspectral has, has actually allowed us to uh, interpret those regions so that's why hyperspectral is considered more uh, important in these days and uh, hyperspectral sensors the space borne or uh, Uh, airborne sensors they are actually called as imaging spectrometers because the uh, spectrometry the field spectrometry is the precursor of this uh, uh, 
uh, hyperspectral uh, sensors. So uh, once the third dimension has been added from the uh, to from the two D graph to the three D graph, so the three D image has been generated. Third dimension as the image has been generated. This uh, has actually got the name of imaging spectrometer. So it actually acquires data at hundreds of bands. So there are several areas of uh, applications that is available. So environmental monitoring or uh, vegetation monitoring and uh, mental exploration, defense, all these uh, areas are having a lot of uh, applications uh, for this uh, hyperspectral data. And uh, as we discussed, uh, hyperspectral data provides a continuum spectrum. So spectra of materials are continuous. So here we can see in uh, four band, four band multispectral signature. So we have uh, in turbid order, we have got only uh, one, uh, like one peak over here and everything is flat. Whereas we consider the turbid water in hyperspectral signature, we have seen one peak over here and one peak over here, absorption and again peak. So the, all these minor details are being uh, recorded. So uh, the crucial information are uh, missed in uh, multispectral data while it has been recorded in the hyperspectral signature. So in uh, so that's why in uh, multispectral data, it is dis difficult to discriminate similarly reflecting objects. In multispectral uh, 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 multispectral spectral space, uh, two different objects, but they have almost similar reflectance means it would appear the same in multispectral data. Uh, whereas in hyperspectral, based on its physical properties and chemical properties, even the small changes could also be recorded and considered for classification. And we can clearly say these two objects are different. So uh, how we can approach with the hyperspectral survey? So we have to, we can go with the high upscaling approach, like uh, we can go for the ground truth. So uh, first we have to identify the different places we have to uh, do the ground truth verification prior to that, because we have, we are going to sample the location. So we have to record the locations, what are the features present there. So we can sample, we can do some spectral sampling, sorry, uh, stratified sampling. Then we can go for a laboratory spectra or a field spectra. So field spectra in the sense, uh, uh, you can record uh, the spectral signature of these uh, uh, different objects using some imaging spectrometer or, fee or uh, field spectrometer, field spectrometers, uh, or uh, you can carry these uh, materials to the laboratory and you can uh, record the uh, uh, data or uh, spectral signatures in a controlled environment. And uh, or you can go for the next stage. You can go for drone survey. You can fix the fix the uh, instrument in a drone, and you can uh, you can fly the uh, 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 sensor at a low altitude uh, to image at the uh, to image or to know the composition of that uh, surface. You can do some drone survey, and uh, or further like you can go for uh, uh, aerial or unmanned air vehicle, aerial, uh, like manned aircrafts or unmanned air vehicles. You can mount the sensor in uh, aircraft, and we can go for uh, aerial survey or next week and next stage, which is the uh, last stage is hyperspectral hyperspectral sensors. So it's a space borne hyperspectral sensors. So these sensors are continuously orbiting the surface and access the data at a specific time uh, based on its temporal resolution, previous time. So we can have the uh, data. So this is the general upscaling approach in uh, hyperspectral survey. So field spectrometry actually, uh, uh, so this is the beginning uh, beginning of the uh, hyperspectral survey. Uh, field spectrometry actually, like every like every so like every surface, when some incident energy has been uh, like incident light has been uh, hit the surface, so some amount of energy has been scattered, uh, some amount of energy has been absorbed, some is transmitted and some is reflected. So reflected energy is up uh, if we are uh, concerned with the above, above the uh, reflected energy, uh, then it is a reflective spectrometry, a field spectrometry, which is reflective. And the based on the energy of the incident light, the material actually heats up and it emits the energy. Uh, so uh, that is actually, uh, that is actually measured in emissive spectra. So that is, these are two different domains uh, because of the wavelength, what we are concerned on. So reflective energy is mostly concerned about the uh, visible near infrared 
and uh, shorter infrared regions in emission spectra it is more uh, like thermal infrared and uh, reflective spectra is the characteristic of uh, biochemical and biophysical traits of uh, vegetation or uh, uh, materials whatever it is and uh, uh, emission spectra is mostly uh, mostly dependent on the absorb absorption property of the mineral uh, components how how what are the regions which these regions these materials have absorbed so these are the uh, different tribes we can uh, extract from the uh, uh, we can have uh, we can extract from the uh, spectra what we have obtained and uh, of course the reflection and absorption as we have seen in the basics of uh, this uh, interaction with the terrain or the atmosphere it depends purely on the chemical composition physical and textual properties of the uh, earth surface um, materials or earth surface features what we are uh, concerned on so what causes actually the absorption so absorption when uh, this actually happens in two general process one is electronic process and the other one is vibrational process uh, electronic process is process is similar to the photoelectric effect so the in Incoming photon is been uh, like one photon with the particular amount of energy is been incident on a particular atom, so that atom actually absorbs the photon, and so the electron in the lower energy level, which is excited to the higher energy level, so uh, that, that actually happens within a very short span of time. Uh, it actually uh, loses the energy and comes back to the lower energy, original energy level, sometimes to the much lower energy level. so based on at what uh, at at uh, like uh, at how many stages it uh, uh, going up and uh, getting down the emis the energy of the photon is the uh, the some amount of energy is also going away from the um, atom so that is actually uh, uh, called uh, uh, photo electron or uh, uh, the energy which is having uh, emitted which is with a particular wavelength so that process is called electronic process in vibrational process what happens is uh, see the infrared region infrared energy which actually causes some vibration on the uh, chemical bond between the uh, between the atoms so uh, the this absorption of this infrared uh, energy actually sometimes it may rotate the atom, sometimes it may stretch the atom so to it to cause the vibration so this uh, stretch may be sometimes symmetrical Uh, or uh, asymmetrical, or uh, it can uh, rotate. It can, it can, it can be a combined effect of rotation and uh, uh, stretching, and uh, it can also uh, sometimes it can move away. That the chemical bond maybe a little bit can move away from each other. So all these processes uh, can uh, like over ride one over the other, and this actually causes the absorption of some some energy because this some amount of energy has been spent for this stretching and bending and rotating, right? So for due to that some energy has been lost by the photon which is incident on this particular atom at a particular wavelength so that energy is that energy has that particular amount of energy has caused some absorption in the outgoing uh, photon so this is what the absorption is actually doing with the photon incident on it so like human being we have uh, we have our own fingerprint uh different materials on the earth surface have its own signature so in uh, remote sensing perspective uh, particularly in hyperspectral remote sensing perspective we call it as a spectral signature so at each wavelength so at each wavelength a particular material absorbs or emits based on its biochemical and biophysical component composition okay. so when you see uh, the Uh, vegetation spectra over here so it actually absorbs more in the blue region and it emits more in the sorry not it reflects more in the uh, green region because of the presence of biochemical components like uh, xanthophylls uh, chlorophyll a and b and uh, carotenoids so different chemical components are present in the leaves uh, so that actually causes the reflection of uh, uh, green uh, radiant green wavelength and some amount of like then uh, in red region the absorption is significant because of the same chemical component and uh, the water component present there then uh, it actually the in vegetation the the reflectance in the infrared is much higher because of the cell structure 
how the uh, cells are arranged uh, any air space between the cells is present or not so based on that uh, the reflection is much more higher in the nir region and these two uh, uh, absorption troughs are actually centered based on the water present in the uh, leaf if the leaf is dry then the absorption here would be uh, much more lesser if the leaf is having water then the option is higher so these are some crucial information we get it from we get from the spectral signature of the particular material or particular uh, feature so you can see here the red brick over here so absorption is uh, less uh, like absorption is significant in blue and green while in uh, red the the reflectance is much higher even the uh, based on the chemical composition uh, uh, present in the red soil or red brick uh, the because of the presence of this uh, uh, less presence of uh, less water and the chemical composition of this uh, brick the reflectance is much higher in the rest of the region so similar to that we can see different uh, types of uh, Uh, materials and its uh, reflect and its reflectance over here water we can see uh, with the reflection is much higher and higher comparatively higher in blue and it is getting lower and lower once it reaches the near infrared it is almost zero because near infrared and short range infrared completely absorb completely been absorbed by the water that's why we don't have any reflectance in the region after beyond the region of uh, visible okay so these are the basic Uh, this is the basic uh, uh, component or basic uh, thing we have to know, know about the uh, when we are going to deal with the hyperspectral signatures so uh, uh, like field spectrometry as we as i already discussed it can be of uh, uh, reflective or uh, emissive so reflective spectrometry actually we can have like we have different uh, sensors uh, so this is one such sensor what i have used so this is asd field spec 3 uh, so we have we can sample uh, the image so, so it is not image actually uh, so it is not an imaging spectrometer it actually gives the uh, x and y axis x is uh, wavelength and y is reflectance so the wavelength range which is x axis ranges from 350 nanometer to 2500 nanometer 350 starting from far uv uh, to 2500 nanometer which is uh, uh, short range infrared so spectral sampling interval is like 1.4 nanometer and uh, uh, short wave infrared we can we have 2 nanometer so obviously we are like after resampling we get uh, in, uh, information for every nanometer so 400 nanometer 401 nanometer what is the reflectance 402 nanometer what is the reflectance so similarly like every at every nanometer we get the data so when you connect all these points you get a very continuous curve So which is actually considered for further class further uh, process so source of illumination uh, in field we have sunlight which is passive in uh, uh, in a uh, uh, controlled environment like a laboratory we don't have sunlight so we have to give some uh, similar source so for that we can use tungsten filament halogen lamp uh, and uh, Uh, the crystal height above target may be usually more than 1.5 feet, and in field, uh, since the sun's uh, sun's position is also very important, uh, sun should be at the near nadir position. So uh, it should be like a near new noon time. So 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in a clear sunny day is an ideal day for collecting a uh, spectral data. And in laboratory, there is no time limit, but the only thing the environment should be highly controlled. like uh, no external uh, objects or uh, external reflection should influence the uh, reflectance of this particular material so uh, we in we have three detectors within this uh, sensor one is uh, for visible and near infrared we have for visible and near infrared we have uh, silicon photodiode array and uh, short wave infrared uh, one and short wave infrared two are have they have two sensors which is similar like the same sensor Uh, which is indium gallium arsenic sensor so photodiodes all are photodiode arrays and uh, the reflectance uh, uh, region is also given in, like for visual ray infrared it is 350 nanometer to 1000 and short infrared and 1 and 2 which is from 1000 so uh, uh, the and uh, in uh, 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 like uh, uh, in the usually called uh, uh, 
uh, form infrared spectrometer. So the detector uh, will range from 2 meter to um, 14 micrometer. 2 micrometer in the same form infrared to end of shot to 14 micrometer. This is the infrared region. And uh, since it is the thermal infrared region, the sensor needs to be in a very controlled environment. This sensor has actually been cooled by liquid. That sensor externally from the surrounding environment is not having influence on the sensor. Okay, so uh, they have the sensor, uh, they have the antimony sensor and mercury character in detector. So this is the uh, center they use for uh, central level for uh, So this is a very set to be which is this way. And uh, this is most used in uh, geological because um, geological like uh, to, uh, to understand the uh, chemical composition of the uh, of different uh, minerals and different uh, rocks uh, or different different sand type soil type uh, they have uh, we, they need to understand the uh, absorption of different materials at different wavelength so usually it happens in the, it is used used in the geological mapping rather than uh, or some other application because it is highly expensive and it is uh, more sophisticated and it is little difficult to use so uh, mostly dealt with by the uh, by the geological uh, people geology people and uh, of course also use uh, for uh, vegetation or some other purpose but these complementary information may not contribute more uh, for other uh, other surface map so it is basically used for geological map so what different sensors available uh, like we have uh, we, I, we as i told the hyperspectral sensors are also called uh, imaging spectrometers so uh, we have uh, we have uh, both the uh, airborne sensor as well as uh, space bound sensor uh, everest is advanced very uh, advanced visible infrared imaging spectrometer which is called everest uh, which is operational since 1986 it is a product of uh, nasa and the uh, jpl jet uh, laboratory and it is basically an airborne sensor so airborne sensor the advantage is you can uh, in an airborne sensor in a platform uh, it can be flown at a desired time uh, it you can change the altitude so the, the altitude is here is 20 kilometer so at the, at the height of 20 kilometer the uh, air, aircraft has been uh, flown uh, and uh, you can adjust the altitude so that you can increase the uh, visibility and you can increase the uh, spatial resolution uh, per se. And uh, so these are some uh, uh, like advantages here. So if you have any difficulty, some scalation has happened. So, or you need multiple, uh, like a first location you need to observe for multiple times. At, a, at the different dates or fixed dates, maybe you can have you can use the sensor at the will. So that is one basic um, one one of the specific advantage or distinctive advantage of having an airborne sensor. While in uh, space borne sensor, what happens is um, data reception would be difficult. So if you have like if you have flown one hyperspectral sensor in a, uh, a satellite uh, platform. So it actually crosses one region at a specific time. This is not what altitude or what speed it has been rotating around the Earth. So uh, the we, like if you want a, want it on a particular date, if it is not available, we have to be get compromised ourselves by uh, taking the data one prior or after to the after that date. So, uh, so we can't have a control over the we don't have any control over the space, temporal resolution of the data. Uh, one more difficulty is that. Uh, if you want to get the, like you, we cannot increase the number of bands also. So like uh, you, like in Hyperion, the second example, which is uh, uh, one space-borne hyperspectral sensor from NASA, and it has been uh, it was actually operational in Earth Observation Earth Observer uh, One uh, satellite, which has recently been decommissioned in the year, in the year 2016, I, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, that actually flown in the that is actually was actually revolving around the earth at the altitude of 705 kilometer so we see the difference between 20 kilometer and 
seven or five kilometer. So how, like here we can see. So at the, on that particular height, seven or five kilometer. At that particular speed, they can image the Earth at the this resolution only. Thirty meter means one pixel of this uh, Hyperion image represents thirty meter by thirty meter on the ground. Whereas in airborne, we can uh, like they have this multiple resolution, four to twenty meter. So how did they obtain four to twenty? Based on the altitude, they can change the altitude. So they can change the altitude. They can uh, have some time uh, to like they can the following the Flying um, uh, speed can be uh, reduced. So based on that, they can have, they can have they can adjust the resolution for 20 meters. That depends on the user, what what the user wants and how they want to use the resolution. Okay. So in a number of consider the number of spectral bands. So every is have two 24 bands and. Uh, both uh, both are having the same spectral range, which is um, visible to uh, short range infrared optical region, optical uh, remote sensing only. And uh, the the number of bands is also not much different. Like this, Everest is 224 band and Hyperion is 220 band. Uh, but the thing is, like uh, when we have a spectral uh, uh, resolution, like we have a number of bands. If you want to increase the number of bands, for example, in uh, uh, airborne sensor. Uh, we can increase the number of spectral bands so that uh, like that they did when you increase the number of spectral bands component like uh, accordingly the uh, data volume may also increase because uh, if, uh, so if i give one unit uh, uh, for example he may need one hour or two hour for to study for that if i give four units means he may need much more much more time right all units for in this so the performance may reduce like uh, it depends on the capability of that particular person, of course but in general it reduces so generally if you increase the spectral bands data wall will increase a lot so the to in airborne sensor you can talk like you talk uh, you can get back to the get back the sensor and you can uh, re retrieve the information retrieve the uh, recordings and then you can fly again in a re desired time but in, uh, in a space -bound sensor it is not possible because it actually it we don't have control we can't stop the satellite so it actually uh, revolves around the earth uh, at a specific time so the ground station needs the ground receiving station or like a data transmission station needs some time, a time to uh, transmit the data so if we increase the data volume the transmission of data will also get uh, affected so the storage capacity of the satellite once fixed is cannot be adjusted later so that also affects so that's why the space bond sensors uh, even the upcoming sensor you can see here uh, like uh, from jaxa hyperspectral hyperspectral imaging suit uh, which has been planned in 2020 or hyperspectral imager from yes they are planned for 30 meters they are not going for higher spatial resolution because of these difficulty because of the data reception and data storage uh, difficulty uh, these sensors are not planning for much higher spatial resolution, but they attempted to increase the number of uh, spectral resolution, uh, uh, but not that much higher. So that is also a, a different. But they show the difference to different uh, wavelength. So they increase the they they try to increase the the range of uh, wavelength they use for image acquisition. So that is how they can we can have diverse data. So they have the data from different wavelength. So that we can um, you can have, uh, you can have you have different diverse you have diverse data to process. So uh, this is uh, space bond. We have uh, Prova one satellite uh, compact high resolution imaging so Chris uh, Chris Prova which was launched in two thousand one which is also currently high is Prisma or some kind of operational satellites. So uh, it has been is, uh, uh, revolving around uh, the earth in 556 uh, kilometer height. And uh, here we see the spectral range is less, like 415 to 1050. So it is only 
a visible and near infrared they uh, take uh, short wave infrared uh, spectral band is also less so only in 63 bands they collect the data and uh, but the spatial resolution since they have reduced the number of spectral band they have this freedom to increase decrease the uh, spatial resolution so they are 18 meter to 36 meter so they have in multiple uh, they have in multiple mode they have multiple resolution so india's uh, indigenous uh, hyperspectral Hyperspectral imagery, hyperspectral imaging satellite is also available. Uh, like ISIS hyperspectral imaging sensor, uh, like uh, it's a part of IMS Indian Indian main satellite uh, too. Um, it's been operational in two, since 2018, uh, so the range is from 400 to 2400 nanometer, and uh, they collect data in 326 bands. Uh, spatial resolution, uh, spectral resolution is 10. Uh, the spatial resolution is on experimental basis. They try with the 30 meter. Since now the hyperspectral data is not available to the public use for as before, I think, uh, but it will be soon available for the end user. So uh, when you take uh, Prisma, the same example like uh, 5 to 30 meter resolution, uh, 238 uh, uh, spectral bands. So it is also a satellite based uh, sensor and. Uh, Like uh, the the five meter resolution in the sense it is not for all the bands only for specific band they give at five meter resolution not for all the bands yeah so these are mapping satellites like uh, hyperspectral image from uh, like a map satellite uh, the uh, uh, general space center and the uh, Europe space agency uh, this is from Japan space center high speed it's also been planned in 2020 and this is NASA's new venture. and uh it's a they actually started a project the hype a high hype star uh, right which means hyperspectral sensor for image uh, hyperspectral uh, infrared image which because it uh, in the it in like it doesn't it's a short wave reflective it also includes infrared image but at the high speed like steam resolution So in two seventy bands. So this is the uh, this is the comprehensive uh, information on our uh, data like sensors, hyperspectral sensors available uh, for uh, for uh, public use or uh, in in the future. So some, what are the opportunities in hyperspectral uh, data? So we have a plethora of information. So we have uh, lots of information available, like. Uh, Uh, not yet. Uh, not uh, uh, information has been made because crucial information are very important. Uh, in this perspective, so we have a lot of information. Uh, then uh, higher level classification is also possible. So if you want to classify for go for level three or level four classification for land use, then the broadband multispectral data is of no use or of having only limited use. So you can go for uh, hyperspectral data. And narrow band indices, like uh, some image specific directions, like if you want to go for as uh, uh, like vegetation indices, the standard vegetation indices we know, 9 dBi, normally it's different vegetation indices. If you want to go for some uh, red edge uh, index, means then you need a band red edge. So that is what needed. So red edge indices, this is the region between the red and infrared. So That you need a very narrow band to develop a narrow analysis. Then the challenges. So uh, like we have opportunities in hyperspectral data as well as we face a lot of challenges in uh, processing such hyperspectral data. One is the major co- major thing is computation and storage. So it requires high uh, sophisticated storage and uh, data processing hardware and software. So that is not fully achieved so far. So uh, we do have uh, developed so many sophisticated storage and uh, data processing platforms. Hyperspectral, hypertemporal uh, data processing is difficult. Hypertemporal in the sense, if you have hyperspectral data for a same place at different dates, like uh, next consecutive dates, means then you have added that much amount of uh, uh, like you have the data volume is has drastically increased. So to process and to store the data, you need a Sophisticated hardware, and to process the data, you need a high-end software like uh, some sophisticated, robust software we need. So that is still in development stage. Then data dimensionality. 
so we have seen uh, like in opportunity we have mentioned that it is a plethora of information so a lot of information is available so but uh, a lot of information is also sometimes uh, it's a curse of dimensionality so we have added so many dimension we have like uh, different uh, at different bands, dimension in the sense the bands so we have added so many number of bands that actually has in processing the data so that is one phenomenon in what is called the Hughes phenomenon. So if you want to classify a uh, satellite image in uh, image processing software, uh, if you have uh, like uh, that image is actually from a Landsat, for example, we have eight bands. So uh, I will classify uh, a color scene, and that scene contains some four or five uh, land use uh, classes. So I at least I need like uh, for each class I first for for classification I need to train the software right train the classification algorithm. So for that I need to give at least uh, one uh, pixel in number more than number of bands I use. So in Landsat where I use I had eight bands. So at least nine pixels nine nine pixels I have to give for each class. So if I have uh, four classes for classification, so for each for each of these four classes, I need to at least nine pixels for classification. While uh, this is the hyperspectral like multiple data, but while it's a hyperspectral data, which is having some two hundred bands or two fifty bands, but you are seeing uh, if we are seeing this, we can find that still contain a limited number of classes. Means it is fine. But one, once you are seen as having a limited area, but the number of features present within the area is more, highly heterogeneous means, then this the data dimensionality problem may arise. So you want to, like, you have used bands, you need at least 201 pixels for each other. So you have 11 classes, 11 classes, 201 pixels for each other. Uh, for some classes, it may be. Or, uh, like uh, normal classes, but for minor classes, you may not get it. So, data dimensionality is sometimes a curse or sometimes a difficult, uh, add some difficult dimension to uh, process, uh, processing. Uh, you use a hyperspectral. Then comes the trade off between spatial and spectral resolution. Sp trade off in the sense that like, uh, if you increase the spatial resolution, then you have to compromise your spatial resolution for at least for. Uh, uh, space based sensor so that is what we have discussed in the earlier example like the non availability of pure uh, pixels in highly heterogeneous uh, uh, environment became um, uh, difficult because uh, when you increase the aspect resolution you have to compromise the spatial resolution so you decrease the spatial resolution so you go uh, like a 40 minute resolution means uh, if you have a Pure view to obtain a pure pixel has become a difficult thing. So, if you go to a forest of a forest uh, region, you have different uh, uh, trees, uh, like different uh, um, different varieties or different species. Species are present in this short uh, region. So, one if the one 30 meter by 30 meter long lot is being occupied by four or five species, means. Uh, you cannot easily identify, it is much more difficult to identify. Like, to particular, we, we don't know which uh, for for that particular pixel or which species should be, uh, which label should be given to the particular pixel. So that, that actually has been a very difficult thing for a heterogeneous environment. Then comes the uh, data redundancy. Data redundancy in the sense, so you have uh, really in, in our free spectrum, we have seen, uh, each nanometer we go. Data. But the problem is sometimes the constitute or successive a nanometer may have the same property. So the neighboring band also are, are highly correlated to each other. So that actually leads to a multicollinearity problem. The multicollinearity problem means that all bands are related to each other. So when you process this multicollinearity problem may arise. Then comes noise. So it is often affected by well-defined like atmospheric absorption feature. So uh, like the haze and uh, uh, clouds and water vapor present in the atmosphere actually influences the data a lot. So it actually it actually so that actually processes a uh, noise in the hyperspectral data. 
so uh, the kind of scenario we have discussed in the earlier slide also uh, in case of like these are some uh, recent uh, trend like we have a lot of open source and arcade remote sensing and vector data to different platforms like us just uh, google uh, like allos and so uh, like pernicus platform for real space in c data uh, in the of the global network uh, approval and a uh, calibration need to be done properly before it is there and some of the some of the in development so it's not fully achieved in say for in 10 years we have a uh, fully achieved or some fully operational data portal may be there so uh, in case of uh, like open source remote sensing and ga software so uh, the oh, community based um, like uh, the JS and remote sensing community like uh, uh, they have this experimental based software algorithms they develop and they distribute so these are some of the softwares open source softwares rather than commercial software we can go for some open source softwares also so these programming languages and uh, available to for so these are the, these are all in the developmental stage so uh, these are some of the existing platforms for uh, code code available and uh, processing algorithms available in the uh, layer internet then robust hardware and switch computing facilities are developing because continuously that sensor technology has been evolving uh, competing to that the storage and the hardware and software technology is also evolving with it so we cannot uh, say that it is has fully achieved it would be a different stage so to compensate to compare to uh, compatible to be compatible uh, industry to uh, to process such a highly robust data the hardware and software industry has also uh, is also evolving along with the data so it is also in a development stage so what will role of what are potential roles of management so when you take a uh, management uh, perspective so how the acquisition is playing crucial so first it, it actually it is needed for uh, to have a basic like a mapping and business assessment it is needed. so uh, once you map the acquisition so that was i'm interested in for so i have to have a uh, proper base map for the forest area then only i can go for monitoring so how it changes how the forest area changes over time so for all the for all these uh, stages we need earth observation data report sensing data so based on the monitoring i can frame objective like if the forest is continuously degrading so my objective uh, is to how how the forest has changed from last four decades so how based on that that is my major objective based on that i can frame the target so how the uh deforestation uh, like, over the years at what interval the, the this has been uh, this has uh, gone like how the what rate deforestation has become more intense so all these targets we can frame and uh, based on that we can have a uh, site and landscape waterscape management so we can recommend the uh, management agencies like uh, some emergency plan or some uh, management strategies we can uh, propose and uh, beyond that we can come up with some further management approaches so we can uh, frame a uh, uh, state and uh, trend assessment we can make do the monitoring uh, and can measure uh, indicators so policy or Uh, to go for specific data, uh, we different purposes we can use. So for atmosphere, we can use for uh, the absorption of how far it is to the space and time, 
and cloud properties are so it is mostly used in atmospheric remote sensing perspective in ecology i use uh, uh, chlorophyll content uh, uh, like uh, like how uh, the like, uh, biochemical uh, to market the variability or the recent time for a particular region or uh, uh, for a particular crop so for to monitor by properties and for geology mineral and soil mapping and coastal waters like phytoplankton uh, are dissolved organic matter many materials uh, suspended sediments so these things uh, we can use it in coastal waters and in snow and ice we have like the snow cover fraction grain size melting so glacial uh, uh, remote sensing is a evolving subject nowadays and uh, biomass burning like the forest fire mapping Uh, what the temperature of that uh, uh, forest over the region? So, what are the region vulnerable for forest fire? Those are some biomass burning application and commercial like mineral exploration, resource management, uh, forest protection. So, these are some commercial applications of like in the the purpose of commercial utilizing of so uh, like a hypothetical make contribute. So uh, I can I I give the example of uh, hypersolar remote sensing which in science. So this we have seen the earlier example. So this is the uh, I like a leaf spectra. Like leaf spectra is in the spectral signature of leaf or vegetation, uh, ranging from point uh, micrometer, which is uh, to uh, two point five micrometer, which is uh, uh, shorter infrared. Here we have the blue uh, absorption. And uh, the red absorption. These two absorption is the property of chlorophyll absorption. So the chlorophyll present in the leaf actually is the function. Uh, it actually responsible for the uh, absorption at the blue and green as well as the reflection at the green. So chlorophyll is the uh, chlorophyll or any biochemical component present in the uh, leaf present in the vegetation is responsible for uh, reflectance at this region. So that is what. Point to infrared. If pigments is a, a major factor controlling the reflectance in this region, where in this region, so this region to this region, so like one like a real infrared, uh, say for example from point eight one point three, the mesophyll uh, spongy mesophyll. Uh, in the when you take the cross section of the leaf, the mesophyll cells present in the leaf actually is responsible for this sky this uh, reflectance. In this particular region, because it scatters the this wavelength. So, if the mesophyll is densely absorbing, the scattering will be more, and the the it would reach a uh, over here. The height, the intensity will be higher. If the mesophyll is loosely arranged, then it will transmit energy, so it can come down here. So, these rest of this region is basically the function of how much water is present in the uh, vegetation spectrum, uh, vegetation. So, that controls the Absorption in these regions, these these three troughs. Okay. So here we have seen uh, the uh, only zoom this region. So this is xanthophyll. These are the nutrients, uh, chlorophyll and carotenoids. And this is pigment. And this is the water stage. So this is the this peak actually the uh, uh, like how much the cells are, how good the cells are arranged, and how the chemical is controlling the. Uh, controls the reference. So here we can see. So this is called red edge. This region is called red because it actually the from red it, it is edging to the near infrared region. So this peak once it touches here, this peak is called red edge. Okay. So this uh, green biomass is responsible for the reflectance at the red region. So if uh, uh, Vegetation is in stress, then the region, then the peak will be moving towards the north. So that is why this this region is much more important in vegetation science. So this is a normal uh, background image for different bands, green, red, and near infrared for a particular region, mango, uh, in a multi-spectral uh, region. So here we can see uh, in uh, all these. Uh, uh, Three in all these. Uh, this is sand. This is mangrove. And this. So in uh, A, in A, this is A. Green is A. Red is B, and uh, NaRC. So in green, the water reflectance is higher. 
uh, red is uh, lower and c it is no no difference and that it is the in it is in green it is, it is dominant when you compare mangrove uh, we have given in, in mangrove the green is higher red is lower and in nr it is much higher this difference difference is much higher comparatively red in, uh, in this image in infrared image mangrove is looking higher in the sand everywhere here, this is sand so these regions are sand so in all which we can see a white color because the return is much higher for sand in all these three parts. So when we compare these three points, when we are saying red uh, color for red, green color for red and blue for green, since we have seen in water, uh, green is high and not all, here green is, has been seen the color blue here, so it is blue. And in the, uh, for example, in blue, it is high. Yeah, yeah, I have been asking for red, that's why mangroves are playing in red in color. When and all the things are the same. So, when you have RGB in the same, like the style, you get to make them. That's why the sand is white. We almost get this false color colors because it is not a true color. Because the difference is not the end value red. It is the uh, the, it is the, the, uh, which, uh, reflecting more than air, and air has an ascended value of red. It is in. So, this is, this is a simple uh, band combination used in minus spectrum also. But uh, if you have multiple of bands within this number, within this, uh, within uh, multiple of bands within this NIR, you can choose the band from the NIR region, then you can generate different combinations. So uh, this actually is on uh, uh, in visible region. The in visible region is actually controlled by the cell structure. And uh, the difference in visible and short infrared region depends on the leaf arrangement and so how the arrangement is there. The leaves are arranged at the canopy level. So the uh, actually gives the idea on the reference in the short infrared region. Uh, so here, what example? So these are some mangrove classes. Okay. So this is a uh, different species and their respective uh, like uh, So these are the cells. So we can epidermis, so cells, other plants, moyas. Uh, dear speakers, there is uh, dear participants. Uh, there is a small uh, network issues uh, for the speaker. All of you, please stay.
Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's audible. Audible. Hello, sir. Any problem? Please. Yeah. What? At what point of time my presentation got disconnected? I'm not sure about that. Uh, eleven forty-seven something slide. Oh, eleven forty-seven in the sense that what slide you can can you identify the slide? Sir, regarding uh, uh, one second. Atmospheric correction. Yes, sir. That shift in it yes. indicates stress in vegetation. That rate, age, inflection point. Okay, 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 okay. That's light. That that should be the last one. Yes. Rate, yeah, age, yeah. inflection point. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sorry for that. I don't know why it got disconnected. So I just uh, present it again. No issues. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. so uh, so this is the uh, image uh, uh, we have like uh, this is a multispectral image uh, for different uh, bands so here we have uh, three different bands uh, green uh, red and uh, uh, near infrared bands uh, like uh, this is the green band this is red band and this is near infrared band uh, so this is the spectra we have got uh, for a green band uh, for water the reflectance is higher Uh, compared to red and near infrared, it is completely uh, zero. Uh, so we have we can see it is brighter, little bit darker over here, and it is completely dark for water. In mangrove, we can see some. This is, uh, sir. Oh, uh, sir. Uh, presentation is not uh, visible. Okay, one minute. Okay. okay. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm. Uh, one second. No, no, no. No, 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 sir. No. Is there is it now? No, no, no. Is it visible now, sir? Ah uh, no, sir, no, sir. Ah, uh, only another photo is only. Ah, uh, one second, sir. Ah uh, yeah, okay, sir, okay, 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 fine. This visible now. Sir. Okay, sir. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, so, uh, so this is the multi-spectral imagery of uh, mangrove uh, region uh, for different. Three different bands: green, red, and near infrared. So this is a uh, green band, this is red band, and this is near infrared. So the corresponding uh, spectral uh, curve is given here. So for um, uh, for uh, water, uh, green is uh, uh, like a green is having higher reflectance. Obviously, it also have some brighter color over here. And for red, it is a little bit darker because it's less reflectance. Uh, have some less reflectance when compared to green. And near infrared, it is dark because it is completely absorbed in the near for water. When we take mango as an example, so green is having a bit higher reflectance, so it appears a little bit brighter over here, and then it is absorbed. So and near infrared, it is having much higher reflectance when compared to green. So it is that's why it is appearing more brighter over here. Sand in all the three uh, in all three uh, bands, it is uh, it is having my higher reflectance, so it appears brighter over here. So these are uh, these are sand regions. So when you combine these three uh, images, we have got a, 
uh, image like this so this is the this is called a false color composite because mangrove does not uh, appear in red color in true image but combined in such way it appears in red color because we have seen red color for nir band green color for red band and blue color for green band so since the mangrove is having higher reflectance when compared to these three bands nir is having higher reflectance and we have seen red color for nir so that's why it is having a red reflectance so a red, a red color it appears red in color in case of uh, water green is having more reflectance uh, having higher reflectance when compared to red and nir here we have given green blue for green band that's why it appears blue in color in case of sand all three reflectances are the same almost same so red green and blue when you have equal reflectance it appears white in color so this is called a uh, false color composite uh, this is uh, usually used for this as a type of combination is usually used to dis discriminate the vegetation species which is not vegetation from the other land uses okay so uh, the reflectance is uh, in visible region and the near infrared region is basically a function of biochemical property and uh, cell morphology of the uh, leaf uh, whereas in uh, say like uh, in uh, in the region of short ray infrared and visible region it is basically the function of uh, leaf arrangement and canopy arrangement so that is what uh, that is why the uh, leaf Uh, like the vegetation is uh, that is the basic idea of having a vegetation spectra so this is uh, three different species of uh, these are the three different species of mangrove and uh, clearly we can see the difference between these two species in all uh, in all the uh, dimensions like here that leaf arrangement is different when like the leaf arrangement is different and uh, leaf structure is different so uh the uh, the here when you see the biochemical property the cell arrangement is different the cell composition is different the mesophyll cells are uh, arranged here whereas here it is arranged over here the air space is much more higher in this for the species whereas the air space is less for the species so these are the different biochemical and biophysical properties of leaf which controls the visible and near infrared and near infrared and short wave infrared region so to to know the exact variation among these three species uh, like how these species would uh, respond to the like how these species would change we need to have very clear idea about the reflectance uh, uh, variation for that the field spectrometry or aging spectrometry would be the viable way to attain the reflectance. so when you take hyperspectral data analysis so in general when you take hyperspectral data we need to have a atmospheric correction then uh, after atmospheric correction we can uh, do dimensional detection so as i told earlier uh, we have 240 plus bands means it is uh, difficult to attain a number of pixels for classification so you can extract on useful bands out of the 240 bands so you can reduce the number of bands to 100 or 50 so that we could be much useful so uh, data dimensional detection may be done and uh, following that you can identify the you can do the supervised classification in mixture modeling is an another aspect like in a single within a single pixel you have multiple number of uh, feature different features so, uh, the which uh, so we have assign the pixel we have to label the pixel to a particular class so which it should be assigned assigned so for that we need to have a you need to do mixture modeling. so that we will see next slide so uh, for that we only you have you need to have spectral library for each species how the frequency is there so this is what we have done uh, so this is uh, in odisha we have bitterkanika national park which is a mangrove reserve forest the survey has been done uh, within this forest so this is a field survey so in field uh, based like we have uh, in uh, in field data collection as well as this is laboratory data collection this is a spectro radiometer instrument which collects uh, data from 350 nanometer to 2500 nanometer so this is the spectral curve of uh, different eight different species belonging to the same family uh, called rhizophoraceae and these are the eight different mangrove species but the difference curve is different you can see the difference because uh, this is because of the difference in their biochemical and biophysical property so here we can see there is a, a gap in the curve so this is actually corresponding to the atmospheric uh, water vapor absorption 
water vapor absorption is highly prominent in this region in field we cannot control the absorption because the sunlight is traveling through the atmosphere so uh, whatever the energy we receive this region is having high attenuations so we cannot do uh, we can we can't uh, do the uh, we cannot uh, receive the signal properly in this region so we eliminate this region but in laboratory the condition is much more controlled so you close down all the uh, other reflecting region and you have the temperature controlled so in this condition the water vapor uh, is not having much uh, dominance over the spectral region so that's why the spectra is is having uh, is uh, having no uh, errors in this region these two region and the spectra is full in laboratory condition so these two spectra can be the, the laboratory collected spectra and field collected spectra can be taken as the uh, training sample or they are taken as the reference spectra for further classification so this is the uh, earth observation one hyperion uh, hyperspectral sensor and and uh, this is uh, some specification what we have seen earlier so this uh, sensor is having 242 spectral bands and uh, this sensor this data is collected in 2000 uh, in november and uh, at uh, the spatial resolution of 30 meter so each pixel in this image is covering the ground res resolution of 30 meter by 30 meter so first thing to do is atmospheric correction so uh, uh, the atmospheric correction like uh, we have seen the atmospheric components has much impact on the image quality so the haze the water vapor or some fog present on the surface of the uh, atmosphere surface of the earth uh, may have uh, uh, may have a decent impact on the image so to we have to have we have to remove the uh, atmospheric attenuations so this is needed when you are going to compare the uh, Uh, data uh, with the another uh, uh, like another data of the same location at different date so it like may like basically for change detection analysis or multi temporal uh, analysis you need the you need to do the uh, atmospheric correction uh, if you are going to do only classification for a single date imagery atmospheric correction is not a, not a, uh, much needed or not mandatory if we can, if we do so it is fine or it is uh, like rather it is not mandatory but uh, when you do the change direction analysis for uh, the change direction analysis for uh, different for, for the same location or for different dates so say for uh, from 2000 to 2020 so in 2000 for the how the, the location was like, like how the location was and in 2020 how the location is now so you need to do some land use land cover classification means uh, in in 2000 the atmospheric condition uh, i i didn't i don't have any idea in 2020 using some sensors and all i can have i can get the data but uh, how can we uh, assume that 2000 sky condition and atmospheric condition is the same as that of today so that is different right so uh, to to make these two um, images homogeneous or comparable you need to do the atmospheric correction some using some radiative transfer models like motron or flash so these are some radiative transfer models available uh, with the commercial so you can uh, give the inputs uh, like uh, like what is the time of data uh, data, data time of uh, collection and uh, what is the um, at, uh, like what is the time of uh, like a uh, image so all these condition if you need to give and the latitude longitude if you give based on that it assumes the Uh, uh, it assumes the atmospheric condition and it removes the atmospheric condition. So this is something for his, uh, like this kind of uh, atmospheric condition we can remove. The clouds cannot be removed because the cloud is uh, cloud. If we remove cloud, it will affect the whole. So that is a different uh, phenomenon. We can't do anything with the clouds. So that's we can take out the clouds. That is the only possible thing. So. One minute. Thank you, my inviting. I will call you later. So, so, the, 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 process how like here but this 
is a single picture in this email. So how we uh, identify it? How can we identify it to some particular species? Only what we have is these are different structures. We have quite different structures. We have like this cell. In front of one or the combination of you know, the two, so the combination of 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 the two, so the 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 combination 60% of A and 40% of B is the result of B. Hello, 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 sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Some network problem had things, so the voice is not clear. Now, Hello, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, what do you mean? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Not clear, sir. No, uh, sir. Some network problem, I think so. Uh, Hello. Hello. Ah, hello, sir. Ah. Hello. Okay. I'm not will. Uh, sir, uh, some. Am I audible now, sir? Ah, now audible, sir. No, no. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, continue. Sir. Continue. Okay, continue. now. Okay, sir. Ah, okay, okay, no, okay, no, okay, no, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm continuing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a particular uh, region, which is actually the uh, um, single pixel. So, this uh, determined is actually representing a single pixel. So, here we can see different species. Uh, present uh, within this particular uh, particular uh, one pixel. So uh, the only clue we have is uh, we have the individual spectra of all the species present here. Based on that, you can do some admixture. So it is like uh, we have got one signal, and that signal we know that it is a combination of multiple uh, inputs. So how can we segregate that, and uh, what is the which component of the uh, co which component of it is dominating the uh, region? So if you take one pixel. So within that one pixel, 30 meter, 30 meter by 30 meter, we have one small uh, uh, pit, uh, like water, water, uh, what small pond is there, one house is there, some grass is there means. So that pixel, that one pixel is the combination of that water uh, house and the um, grass. 
so uh, we need to label that one pixel into some some or any one of these three classes so how can we label that so that can be done using spectral unmixing model so so we can assume that c is the linear mixture of two spectra a and b so uh, so using the speed spectral unmixing model we identify that uh, 60 percentage of a and 40 percentage of b is has resultant into c spectra so we can now label it as a, a, a because the a is contributing more for this spectra c so this is the spectral unmixing model and uh, classification method if we take uh, like uh, we have different uh, classification methods available uh, maximum likelihood uh, uh, minimum distance classifier minimum distance classifier sorry um, uh, parallel classifier many classification uh, methods are available for dominantly like a spectral angle mapper and support vector machines classifiers are maximum used in uh, in this uh, uh, like uh, in the classification uh, classification of hyperspectral data because of the uh, do, because of uh, like in a uh, spectral angle mapper the reflectance is the uh, reflectance is the function of the intensity at a different of the uh, of multi dimensional data so like uh, if we take this other this example is actually having band one and band two so this is only two dimension if we add 100 if we add uh, hundreds of bands then hundreds of dimension are present and this is one reference pixel and these are this uh, this angle between the, the angle between the reference pixel with that of the other uh, classes are compared and the the reference pixel is labeled as a class which is having minimum angle minimum angle so that is spectral angle mapper in support vector machine the positive hyperplane and negative hyperplane would be generated uh, between the classes based on that optimal hyperplane would be drawn to distinguish the uh, classes so this is support vector machine so these are some uh, like classification methods used in classifying hyperspectral data so we have uh, classified the hyperspectral data using a new method called uh, multiple classifier system so uh, first we have got a hyperion image and uh, we reduce the image uh, using uh, different dimensional detection methods like pca mnf ica uh, like a, a principal component analysis minimum noise fraction and uh, independent component analysis then we take a, a, a multiple classifier system like uh, it's a combination of 10 classifiers then we assess for each class which classifier is the best uh, classifier we identify the best classifier for each of the class and we combine those uh, functions to get the classified map so this is the classified map we have got uh, for the hyperspectral data so here we can see the dominant uh, uh, species are clearly visible like uh, say for for dominant stands the clear uh, the, the it is labeled as a single species here but in some cases uh, like uh, like this one the, uh, this is the combination of three species because this region is sparsely vegetated to the some extent and uh, in each region it is highly heter heterogeneous so each pixel is the mixture of three different or four different species so we cannot we couldn't clear, clear, clearly distinguish this is one important uh, drawback of having a low resolution which is mean low spec spatial resolution hyperspectral data so in our case we had uh, hyperspectral data for the, uh, with a spatial resolution of 20 30 meter so with 30 meter data it is difficult to classify at to at a, a micro level so for that we need at least need a 5 meter uh, resolution data which is airborne which could be uh, which would be a additional uh, like a, which would be a very good complementary information uh, for classifying at micro level for broad level classification it is fine but our uh, hyperspectral data should be having higher classification a higher spatial resolution for higher classification accuracy. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Sir? Oh, okay, sir. Uh, part, thanks, sir. Uh, participants, if you have any queries, you can raise now. Uh, the participants, if you have any doubts, uh, you can raise now. I sincerely apologize for this network issue. I am not uh, uh, like I didn't know about that. Uh, like I was continuously taking class. I I didn't know that I have lost the connection because this is screen is full screen. I couldn't know like uh, I have lost no. connection in between. Ah, no, no problem. Yeah. 
participants dear participants if you have any doubts uh, you can raise now Dear participants, if you have any doubt on this uh, session on hyperstructural remote sensing, uh, you can rise now. Okay. Sir, shall we wind up? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. If we do, if they don't have any doubts, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving a valuable session on hyperstructural remote sensing and application. I think this is a fruitful session for us. Uh, I thank all the participants for their kind cooperation uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. The feedback link is now available in chat box. You can fill. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, my mail ID is Arun Prasad at uh, cutn.ac.in. So if you have any doubts regarding this, you can please uh, raise your questions or if you have any. Uh, doubts regarding or any other aspects you can please uh, uh, contact me through this mail id this, this is my mail id i'm sharing through chat box i have shared my mail id through the chat box please check on it sir oh okay okay, okay. thank you so much sir thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity i would like to thank uh, the civil engineering department and the hod and uh, the Francis Xavier Engineering College of Fraternity for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. you can leave now. Uh, the okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, sir, hello, sir. Hello, uh, sir. Sir, uh, yes, sir. Uh, it's a um, uh, query from uh, Indrajit. Uh, sir, can I identify the species, uh, fish uh, species by using hyperstructural remote sensing? That's a query from fish you. species actually uh, yeah fish species is difficult to, because uh, uh, it is under the water right so but uh, we have we can do some uh, indirect query like uh, like some type of phytoplankton is uh, like some fishes may be uh, like uh, which which is feeding on certain type of phytoplankton uh, means you can uh, identify some surface feature which can indirectly estimate or indirectly identify the subsurfaces features. So uh, like uh, some, part some particular type of zooplankton or some particular type of phytoplankton is present on the water surface. And some particular species is much more interested on this phytoplankton means you can identify that or you can uh, relate to that and you can assume that. But fish species is generally not identified because it is under the water. Because there's, uh, the this um, penetration of uh, this microwave, uh, these waves beneath the water is not like it is not uh, usually happening because the reflectance is more in the water. So it is not usually done. Uh, like um, bathymetry for bathymetry mapping and other things, the ground penetrating radar, the radar remote sensing is usually done. So usually the, in fisheries field, um, the people like the people are more interested in identifying the phytoplankton distribution. Using that, the, they identify the potential fishing zones, but fish species identification is not possible with the hypersotter remote sensing. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, okay, sir.